we are going to be in conversation. Are we not, Millie? Thank you, Millie. Thank you, Poonam. Thank you, Team Penguin. Thank you, Shahrukh. Thank you all. It's, um, it's a book that I hope, and I'm, I'm looking at someone sitting right there who I want to write the next book. She's still shying away from addressing it. But I know I'm going to get it out of her. She says she's too young to write it. I said there is no such thing. You can write your first book at 23, and it will still be amazing because there are millions of young 23-year-olds out there, or even 63-year-olds, who would want to read your story earlier. Just do it. So, Karan, let's get the easy stuff out of the way right now. The easiest part of the book, right? Why is India obsessed by your sexuality? Easy. Uh. <laughs> well, that's the, it, the, the, for some reason, as I said, the word conjecture is a word I use very often on my, on my talk show. Uh, well, that is because when people don't have final answers, they tend to kind of, you know, browse around the topic always. And so have I. And, uh, but in the book, um, I've said what I felt the need to, and I've said it in a way that I felt I needed to express it. Um, and there's really nothing more to say. So I think that every answer anyone's looking for is in the book. You know, there are several moments in that book where you talk about people confronting you at airports, yeah. at parties, and saying the most gross things, the most insensitive things, and you come back to them, is sassy, but also a little sad. Why do you have to, why should anyone have to explain any aspect of their lives at all, or defend it? I think Why? Pe people sometimes, um, you know, when you're in the celebrity uh, zone, I think people tend to sometimes just not know what to say. Like, I feel like when they encounter you, uh, they either tend to overcompensate and, and say exceptionally polite things, or they'll say the most inappropriate things to you. I think anyone who's been in the celebrity space will tell you that you'll have people come and say the most over-familiar things to you at times. And sometimes because they think that they own you because you're in their living room on a daily basis, perhaps because of the, my television exposure, or the fact that one is around and, and all over the place, they feel they have an ownership over you. And sometimes that allows them to kind of cross the boundary of decency. And they'll say things that are inappropriate. And you'll have to stand there. Sometimes you can give a response back, which sometimes goes over their head because it's not a straight-lined answer. And sometimes you use sarcasm, which also sometimes doesn't get a response. Sometimes all you do is just, you know, like, like, like Shah Rukh told me the other day, uh, that now when people say things, he just, just nods because, he, uh, because there's nothing else to say. Sometimes you just nod because people say the most bizarre things. And it's not, it's, sometimes it's, it's members of, of the fraternity, sometimes it's members of the media within the fraternity, sometimes it's random strangers at an airport, like, and you have to just deal with it. There's nothing you can do. You can't, at least I'm not the guy who's gonna start getting into a, a, a fight because that's, I don't think I'll have um, the ability to handle it if I was at the receiving end. So uh, I, I just let it pass. May I share that one moment at the airport, which is in your book, so everyone's going to read it anyway, right. where a person comes up to you, uh, he, uh, his wife is with him, and he walks up to you and say, says to you, so are you a homo? Yeah. And your response is, why? Are you interested? <laughs> and I thought that was just fabulous. That's, you know, the aplomb that and the tight slap that probably the man warranted. Well, it was, I, 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 it was what came out, uh, like literally it just came out very, um, because I thought it was an exceptionally inappropriate say thing. And the wife was clicking a photograph of mine while he was asking me this question. And he asked me, patting me on my back. It wasn't just a car, it was an over familiar pat. Like as if like I had, like, like we had dinner last night and he decided to ask me this question early in the morning. And it's happened to me, it's also in the book when I was on uh, the launch of a channel and it was an early morning breakfast interview where I was asked an inappropriate question and I was, I was completely shocked that we were on national television. Of course, it never made it because they realized that it was completely wrong. Luck, fortunately, it wasn't a live telecast. But sometimes you just wonder whether people just don't have the sensitivity or the decency or to sometimes use language to ask a question that may not come across inappropriate. There are various ways. We are all, I'm a member of the media myself, I host a talk show, and I know sometimes when you want to kind of ask something, you can circumvent it with words and vocabulary. You don't suddenly just go up there and ask in the, pre in the pretense of being completely candid or then uh, irreverent or perhaps over familiar. 
But you know, the surprising part of the book, uh, towards the end of the book, when you talk about um, maybe going on to dating sites, I found that fascinating, that you went on to an elite <coughs> dating site and a date was set up for you in Tokyo. And you said, why should I go to to Tokyo to meet someone? How well, did you get onto these uh, dating sites? I that's mean, why? a story in itself. Uh, yeah. Sometimes you have to kind of scratch the surface to find, uh, you know, what's not immediately available. Uh, so there are various ways and means. I think people sometimes have to kind of look at um, when you're single and 44 you'll probably go through every kind of possible available opportunity. I thought that was fantastic because most people would not admit it. I would have actually They'd liked to give the name. They won't. It was a selective, I would have liked to give them the name, but they're so exclusive and, and quiet and uh, have full, like, you know, disclosure issues. Uh, so that's why I didn't give that information. Not that anything's come out of it, and I'm not a success story of their agency at all. Um, in fact, I'm a rather, uh, apparently two out of three people succeed, and I'm that one who failed. You've also talked about uh, three and a half failed relationships. One true love and I think three and a half failed relationships. You've spoken about it with uh, a great deal of, some, some amount of regret and, but compassion, empathy about why they didn't work out. Well, they were not any relationships. They were mostly unrequited love situations, uh, which is great fodder for a filmmaker, not so great for a personal life. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose that comes from your sense of indulgence uh, and over-expectation. Sometimes you tend to expect from quarters that you know won't deliver, and that invariably happens when, you know, you... And that's what I call indulgence, is like if I had a pragmatic approach to love, uh, which is not possible with me, I would possibly have been in a long-standing relationship, but I've always desired what I know I can't have. You also talked about uh, divorce being the new marriage. And throughout the book, there is a kind of a, st uh, a strand which keeps going back to infidelity. And it's like almost a semi-obsessive uh, aspect of your creative process to, <coughs> to deconstruct everybody's marriages and to see who's well, cheating, I, who's lying, well, who's, I don't, who's I living don't, a lie. Because truly, in my experience, I think there's much ado about fidelity and infidelity. I think sometimes true emotion and relationships can go beyond those. And being a single bystander, you tend to be so close to so many relationships and marriages. And in my experience, and I say this, I with, and I don't have any kind of, um, with all kinds of moral policing on my statement, I'm sure, but I don't think infidelity is a deal breaker. I don't think, I don't believe it's it is. It's not a deal breaker. No, I don't think so. It has a lot to do with uh, both of you being successful, very successful in your own right. You say that, that friendships in show business can only succeed if the two people involved are equally successful. Is there something like friendship at all in showbiz? I've made some very strong friendships. Everyone in this room today is from my industry. Um, I, my relationships define me. Um, I, we're low on family. We have very few relatives that we're really connected with, me and my mom. So most of my personal connections are my family, and they're my extended family. I've made the most amazing relationships. In fact, um, I say this to Gauri, um, that I think I'm one of the reasons why I made her love people in the movies. Because uh, when she was initially, when she came in, she was so reluctant to meet people because everyone comes with baggage. But some of my most deep equations and my most solid dynamics have been with people from the movies. So I think it's very unfair to say that relationships, yes, you go through ups and downs and there are always uh, turbulent times. But I have to say that the soul and heart I've found within the fraternity and the industry um, has been amazing. And I will cherish those relationships for the rest of my life. They've, they're all still there in my life. In fact, I'm a very constant person. People who've been in my life for over two and a half decades are still there. In, in a very strong space. And finally, your book ends with your expressing a desire to perhaps adopt a child or have a surrogate child. And you talk about this child as your uh, old age kind of um, a policy to insurance policy in old age. Is I think uh, you have reason. I feel I have a nurturing quality in me. And I saw that most when, uh, when I launched Alia, Varun and Sid. Um, I felt like they, I can't let go of them even now. 
like I feel it's been nearly five years and I feel no matter what they do in whatever capacity they do, when they're on screen or they're at an event or they're anywhere, I see myself staring at what they're doing, what they're saying. So that shows that I, I actually have a sense and even all the directors in Dharma, everyone in Dharma, to me, I'm maybe age-wise, say a decade apart from them, maybe more than that. But the emotion comes from a very strong paternal space. And I feel like I would like to take that forward. I don't know what I'm going to do about it, but I feel like I would like to be a parent. I don't know in what capacity. I don't know how it's going to happen. I have no clue and I don't have answers to those questions. But I do feel the need because I feel I have love to offer. And since it's there, and I'd like to take it forward because I feel like that paternal instinct needs to be acted upon. And I feel it very strongly. Like I feel like I have so much within me that I conserve and I feel that love has to have a release, you know, and it's not going into a relationship. It goes abundantly to my love for my mother and my friends and, and all of them around me and my company. I love everyone. And I like, to me, I'm, I don't think any of them uh, will realize how deeply moved I am that so many of them are here today um, and what they mean to me in my life. I sometimes don't express it enough uh, because it's within me and, you know, and I feel like that love within me needs to find a platform. And I think that platform could be a parent platform. Karan, I wish you every, every success. I hope a baby does come into your life. It'll transform you. It transforms everybody who's ever had a child. And I can tell you that from experience. With uh, four <coughs> grandchildren now, I can tell you that with double experience. Yes. So blessings all the way. Make it happen for yourself. We are very proud of you. We are very proud of the book. It's already a bestseller. And uh, it's got its first brilliant review. So it's a day to celebrate. And may you always remain the wonderful, caring person you are. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, Mili Ashwarya, thank you for publishing the book. Shobha, for convincing Karan to write a book. And all his friends who are here, I'm sure, who have formulated his life, who have uh, uh, you know, done things in his life which comprise of the book that he's written. And uh, Karan, it's a wonderful thing that you've done. I think uh, yours is an extremely beautiful life. Yours is an extremely important life that people should read about. Uh, I don't know if people will learn or not, but it's important to know of your experiences. Uh, my only uh, questioning part of this whole book is uh, the title. Uh, I find that a little different. It could have been titled anything. It could have been titled according to me, apart from the unsuitable boy. It could have been the, the good boy. <laughs> yeah, he's a good boy. Uh, if his father was here, he would vouch for it. His mother is here. She would uh, vouch for it all the time. You know, there are very few boys who sit down with their mothers, sit down with their mothers at night and discuss tele-shopping. <laughs> he does that at 3 a.m wherever he is in the middle of a party, but he'll come back and he'll say, Mom, many soon I would tell you shopping network, but it's not cheese. Here. Let's sit down and buy. And that's a good boy. Uh, he's an intelligent boy. I think that's what the book could have been called. And intelligent, not in terms of uh, just general knowledge or Wikipedia stuff or the stuff we all read on Google, but he understands things. He understands people. He realizes situations. He walks into a room and he knows what's happening. And uh, I find that extremely um, gifted. I think he has a gift from God that he can understand people and use it intelligently. Um, and even with me, if I may say so, there are very few people who can keep up conversations with me because I'm such a genius. But really, I say that with humility and modesty. But he's been able to have uh, conversations with me, the best conversations I've had in my life, late into nights in New York or here. Or sometimes when I'm just alone, I call Karan and say, let's just talk. Uh, he is perhaps one of the most intelligent conversationalists and speakers that there is at a personal level, at a professional level, or at any given level. And if he doesn't know it, he can wing it really, really well. Um, I think he's a very sensitive boy. That's what the book could have been called. Um, and it's a personal experience because I have the inability to express my feelings. I have oversensitivity issues. I am complexed and damaged. But I realize that the only person, apart from my family now, who can give me the space or figure out how I'm feeling uh, has been only Karan. He can make out that 
bhai is angry, bhai is sad, can't say this to bhai. And it's not just me. I've seen, seen him being sensitive to everybody around, from the youngest of people, his team of student of the year, to the eldest of them all. And he can understand what is happening in your heart, what is happening in your soul. He's an extremely, extremely wonderfully gifted, sensitive person. The book could have been called <clears throat> The Brave Boy. And I say this with vehemence and conviction because Karan is different. He's extremely different. And not just in the unique sense, he's different. And it's difficult being different. Especially in our country, in the world we live in, the society that we have to face, he's just different. And to achieve what he has done, with the gusto that he's done this, with the aplomb that he's achieved this, is even beyond the greatest of achievements. Because to be different, and to do, and be accepted, and to run wild and free in this world is a very, very special thing.